You have no choice. I'm improv and I'm good at it. All right. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Whoa, hot mic. That was exciting. Uh, Bruce Pinkleton, Dean of the Murrow College, and uh, we're here to conclude the symposium today. I don't know about you, but I have been completely stoked, a word I used in college quite a bit when I used to surf, badly, I might add. Uh, really, truly excited about what's taken place over the last few days here. We've had just an outstanding uh, meeting with the professional advisory board meeting uh, members rather on Tuesday, and uh, terrific uh, events yesterday. Great panels, a wonderful event, and additional panels today. So, uh, thank you to you for being here and for participating. Really appreciate it. Appreciate the tremendous energy. The panels I was at today, the speakers. I was hearing great uh, information from the speakers and students were asking outstanding questions as well. So it was a really terrific event. And here to close us out is Nick Allard. Nick is a meteorologist at Cairo 7, is that correct? That's right. Awesome. Yep. I'm wearing this. Anyway, okay. Oh, so you are. So anyway, how, how tall are you, Nick? Just, six four. Okay, I'm six four also. So maybe I'm shrinking in my old age. Ooh, this is embarrassing. There we go. Awesome. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Did he just say stoked? Yeah. Okay. Let me just move this around. Wait one second here. Okay. I'm gonna pull this off without making feedback. Hopefully, there we go. Marvin made Connolly play the Darth Vader song. So thank you. I appreciate that. So I gave a speech very similar to this last year at WSU Everett, and it was about, how do I put this, being willing to do what it takes. And I thought that might be a good place to do it again because we're at the end of a few days now, and you've heard from and seen a lot of professionals. And you know that if you're at graduation time and you haven't done X, Y, or Z, it's time. And if you're a freshman or if you're at the beginning of the program, you have an amazing program in front of you that will set you up to do something magnificent. I also found out yesterday the Coug does not have bush light on tap anymore. And, well, two other things. One, Marvin still loves Manhattans. And Gardner Minshew walked into the Coug yesterday. We were having a burger. I'm not kidding. He's wearing George to here. He was wearing a Kiss t-shirt to here. And he was killing it. And there was a lady yesterday at the president's house. We were having a cocktail dinner. She showed me her phone. I got a picture with Gardner. And she said, uh, well, hey, take, take a look at it. I grabbed it. Oh, great. I said, hey, do you want to get a picture? She's like, ah, you're no Gardner. <laughs> she was 174 years old. Anyhow, a little bit about me. I am from Yelm, Washington. I went to Yelm. Yel Seriously? Wow. Really? You drove through once. I'm surprised you made it out. You have a farm. Wow. I used to work on a farm out there. So I'm from Yelm, Washington. You deserve some kind of an award if you make it out of there. And I was a kid. I, was, I wasn't the best student. I was a kid that didn't have a place to go academically for my first year in high school. My brother went to UPenn, went to the Wharton School with Don Jr. That's good or bad. Up to you. Actually said Don Jr. was a nice enough guy, but the point is he went to an Ivy League school and is way smarter than me. I didn't know what I wanted to do. So there was a time, I would say my sophomore year or so, where ESPN had just come out with ESPN News. And I was waiting for a friend to pick me up for a baseball game. I don't know why. It was as simple as, oh, that looks fun. I'll do that. It really was just this little click. I can't explain it. It just really was, I'll just try that. I had no idea what aspect. Did that mean sports? Did that mean TV? Did that mean using microphones? Because I've always loved microphones. So I don't, I don't know. I didn't know what it meant. I just knew it meant something in the industry. I knew that going ahead, so high school kept going. I got kind of competitive, and I started doing better in my classes because there were a lot of people that were doing better than me that were my friends, and I, I, I couldn't allow that. I'm just very, very competitive. So I graduated all right applied for some schools, applied to UW and did not get in. 
I, w I wouldn't have gone. I mean, honestly, I had one teacher that was in the ag department at my high school that said, dude, if you're going to if you're going to do what you think you're going to do, you have to go to Wazoo. So it was pretty well set up. I even toured Western just to say, let me get an idea. And I got accepted to a few others. And Western just didn't feel like home. It's a beautiful campus, but it didn't feel like it. Then I came here with my dad, and we met Neil Robison, which is, he's a legendary professor and was part of beginning Cable 8, if not the main person behind it. And I met him, and they had all this old, horrible equipment. But at the time, it was awesome. And nowadays, I mean, Marvin was even saying today, if you put a tape in one of those machines, it would catch on fire. But at the time, it was cutting edge, or at least the tail end of cutting edge. And I thought, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. So I knew that was it. From there, went to college, and I had this fear. They told us when we went here, I think there's a, I forget what it's called. It's, not, it's the equivalent of rush for fraternities, but there was a week where you came to school ahead of time, and you got to sit in the dorm, you got to go through and walk around campus, and they said roughly 20% of students fail, and I got super nervous because, you know, I just thought, oh, I don't, I don't want to do that. So I had this inkling to dive head first and go right in. First week I'm here, I see flyers for Cable 8, and I see flyers for Sports Crew, which I don't know what it's called anymore. Do you know, Tammy, what it's called anymore? Oh, come on. Just call Scott. Well, forget it. He doesn't work there anymore. She's, she's married to my former boss, so there you go. But anyways, she's like, why in the hell are you talking to me? Anyways, I saw flyers for both of them. That's a good story. And I went to Cable 8 the first week, and I was, I think, the first couple of weeks doing graphics, doing... Who the heck knows? Uh, standing behind a camera op, whatever it was. Loved it. By the end of that first semester, I was at Sports Crew, and I was doing running triax cables behind a photographer, holding the big parabolic mics, which was really cool because they gave you a headset and you could listen in, and that, that's insane. I mean, standing there, I was getting hurt watching the football players. It was really impressive. From there, I had, I think, let's see, another job. I was also working at Pizza Hut. So... I worked at Sports Crew doing occasional games. I was occasionally on a show or working on a show on Cable 8. And then I also worked at Pizza Hut, which is really good for your dating life because you don't smell very good. <laughs> she, she loved it, my, my girlfriend, that year. At the end of that year, we transitioned to what is a different now, with the old replay board at Martin Stadium where they had a dedicated camera where you could show replays. I was that camera guy for the end of the year. That was really cool. I had never done it before, but I was said, I'm willing to try. Everything that year was, I have no idea what's going on, but I'm willing to do it, truly. I, I, I mean, I went in with a completely blank slate, not a clue. And I thought, well, I'll just dive in. I'm, I'm bound to learn something. Into my sophomore year, I somehow, some way, convinced the Cable 8 board to let me run its website. I had never coded Barely opened anything besides like AOL and your stupid you got mail thing. Nothing. I said, I'll figure it out. I'm willing to do it. That year at Sports Crew, I got promoted. And I was, if you look at Martin Stadium, there usually are two cameras on the roof. And Tammy's wife, Scott, was the director at the time. He would allow three or four students a year to run live cameras for a game. And that was cool. Although my training was... Watch, uh, let's see, I guess it was Bart. No, it was Darren. Watch Darren for half, for half the game, and then you just do it. Like, oh, my God, I don't know what I'm doing. I had no idea, but I was willing to try. You get thrown to the Lions, which is Scott's mentality, and I loved it because I made it. I didn't think I was going to, but I did make it. I also hosted my first show that year, and I hosted it with, I think it was Video Underground, and it was with a, a morning anchor in Spokane that I still keep in contact with, and there was still a lot of bush light involved, but that's okay. And it was really cool because not only was I doing something I liked, I had a job working for Sports Crew. I had a job that wasn't paid working for uh, the website for Cable 8, and I had a job teaching a class to incoming freshmen. Also involved lab hours. So I had three jobs. Oh, at that point, still Pizza Hut, but I was done with it after that. I, I quit Pizza Hut. Three jobs was enough. And I was doing all of it, but I didn't feel like work because I was getting my hands dirty. I'm very hands-on. Okay, so I, I really want to illustrate that I was willing to do whatever to figure something out. And that helped me a lot going into the next year because your junior year typically is when you start your major. You go past, which I think is COM 300 now. At the time was COM 295 where, wait, isn't my 295 teacher here? I think I saw her earlier. Hey, there you are. I was awful. <laughs> 
She saw me earlier. She's like, hi. <laughs> I wasn't that bad. I think that was one of my few Bs that I got. B minus ish. We had to get well, like a C, isn't that right? To move forward, something like that. Point is, I, I finished that, and at the time, Neil taught Com 350, which was once you've decided you're going to go advertising, you're going to go broadcasting, whatever it was, you had your first class, and that was Com 350 with Neil. There was no way I was going to get in in junior year and fall. It just it, it was too full, so I stayed and did summer. My first summer in Pullman, and summer in Pullman is fantastic. I didn't. It, Thank you, Brian. I didn't have any money because my three jobs were gone. I actually almost went back to Pizza Hut. Um, but it didn't matter because it was just cool. I was broke, but I was cool. And the good thing was I was willing to do another summer session, and that really set me up for the following year. And hopefully you'll see why in just a minute. Come back that year, and I'm going to attempt to do some crazy stuff. So that year I'm vice president of Cable 8. That's finally a paid position. And then I'm doing the sports crew still, which is every Saturday. And then I'm also teaching that class. So all of that combined, plus I'm producing Video Underground. And did I do, did I direct something that year too? I can't remember. Either way, I was in all of that. And the fun part, and I really, if, if any of you are young enough to know this now, or if you have a chance to create, the fun part was, I took a picture earlier today of one of the shows that I directed. And I sent it to my friends that uh, I haven't, I mean, I still keep in contact with. I said, remember when we did this? And these were friends that I had known since freshman year we had come up with, and we created stuff for years together. And finally, we were in charge of our own shows. And it was awesome. It was really a fun, fun thing. But I also started the split emphasis. I had 365, 355 the first semester, 455 the second semester, and 465 that following summer. So a lot of Marvin. <laughs> Which is unhealthy, a doctor will tell you. But... I did that for a reason because I was willing to get as prepared as possible to move into what I wanted from there. There was even a time when I sat down with Neil in my 355 class. We had hired somebody, this will make Marvin blush, we had hired somebody that worked in film and had never done TV before. It was just a one semester thing. So for example, a Fresnel light, he called a Fresnel. He didn't know. It just was one of those things. So Neil could not find a TA for him. He asked me. I said, no, 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 I'm not doing that. I said, I think that'd be too weird to help out the students while I'm in the class. But I had worked so hard that I could have. And there was a moment or two, well, there were a moment, there were many moments in the class where the TA couldn't explain something. So I'd say, okay, thank you. And then I would just show everybody. Because it was just that kind of that kind of situation. That only happened for one semester. But I was really proud that everything that Cable 8 and Wazoo had had prepared me for that. Into the rest of the year, I had a pretty easy time with certain parts of things. 365, the production aspect was very easy. The, the, on, the talent part of it, if you will, I hate that word, and I'll talk about that later. The on-air part, the personality part, the, the news speaking part, awful. Gosh, I still remember the day that I took my tape to Neil and said, well, and it was a cassette. Please listen to this, and he just, he's like, have a seat. Okay. I sat down, he said, so, Stop. What do you mean, Neil? Just stop trying to be, uh, 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 stop. Just speak normally. And it was a, a complete wake-up call to say, oh, okay, all right, that's, that's a good start. The problem was I didn't quite figure that out enough yet. But when I went into 465, I had a chance to really figure it out because I had done so well in the production aspect of the classes and I had done so well in the other parts. Glenn put me on as the first anchor in 465 in the summer session. I mean, I was shaking, shaking. And I, Marvin always would walk by and say, chin down, chin down, always, just chin down. So I had my chin down straight ahead. And I remember the words, the first line, it was about an earthquake in Oregon and how fast I said it and how awful it was and how sweaty I was. And I thought, oh, I'm supposed to be the person that's great here and I am awful. But I was willing to let that be an example of how I can get better. And I realized I, I didn't get along with the teleprompter very well. Like, the, the, we just, when that red light went on, I, I, I could read fine, but I, I, something about emoting, something about putting it out there, it didn't work very well. So I started switching shifts. And I said, hey, would you mind taking my anchor shift? I'll go to the weather wall. They're like, oh, yeah, 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 sure. I, I don't like weather. I was like, I do. I don't have to read anything. 
So oddly enough, that honestly is what started my weather career. Being terrible at one thing, allowing that to be a learning moment, and then moving on to something else. And I started to really love it. I mean, nowadays, if my anchors die mid-show, hopefully they don't, I could totally read it. I'm much better at it now, but I have a lot more to learn on that respect. Everybody does. Never stops. But that led me to doing weather. And it also led me into the end of that summer session going into Cap 35 in Yakima, which is where I did my internship. Now, I will never tell you where to intern because it's all about where you live, where you're from, what's close. But I really liked the small market because at the time, the news director's name was Mike Baumelli. He was a kook, and he said, if you can prove yourself, we'll let you on air. So his idea was, come here on your own time, do a story, do a package, and if I like it, you can start doing live shots. So I'm just a free reporter the entire time. I mean, I have my own car. I really did have, by the way, the umbilical cord three-quarter deck, and I had just the camera. I mean, we were, I was the only one shooting on three-quarters, but I had it. It was old, and it was awful, but I didn't care. I had my own news car. It was really a fantastic thing. So I took the initiative, and I did this story on some, I think at the time, a 50s-style McDonald's. I mean, it's so silly. But I turned it into something. I convinced one of the directors in the booth to help me put some special effects in because it was all tape to tape at that point. Put some black and white stuff in there. And he loved it. And he said, you can go on air. I was, like, I, I was so nervous because the guy that was there ahead of me, he was super polished. And I thought, I'm, I, I can't do this. But I was willing to fail and just try it. I figured, you know what, I'm going to go on the air. And that turned into resume tape gold because you're live. So the one thing I'll add Again, I will never tell you where to go, but if you have the opportunity to go someplace smaller for an internship, if you can, you more than likely will get your hands dirtier. Not that you can't come to Cairo, not that you can't come to King or wherever else, because you will still learn things, but you can get your hands dirtier if you go a little smaller. That's all I'll say. I'm never going to fault you for going someplace. But at the end of the day, I was willing to go there. And what was funny about that is I, I had a day where... I, this might make Marvin proud. I don't know if I've ever told you this. I was just, again, intern. I'd finished my stories. I, ended run, I usually ran the prompter after the fact. And it'd say it's 4.15. And they look around. They say, oh, we don't have our audio person. Because back then, we actually had different people for that stuff. Used to have a director and a technical director and an audio person and a producer and sometimes a script supervisor. Who, I mean, lots of people. Now it's one person going, ignite button. Oh, i got to click ahead. It really is different. So the audio person didn't show up. I was like, I'll do it. They looked at me and like, no, you can't do that. I said, no, 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 I really will. Uh, okay, because I had run plenty of that stuff, and I did it, and it was okay. I mean, I, I wasn't great. I would say 80% of the time, besides just like a slow pot trying to figure out which anchor I'm supposed to press, I did pretty well. But at the end of it, I did so well that with about 30 seconds left in the show, you remember the old, they're not even cassettes. They're all, you can picture an eight track, but you push it in, you press play, that's it. It does nothing else. You can't go back. You stop, and it's going to re-rack, and it takes time. So I put it in, slammed it in, pressed the button, pushed every pot down. I was like, yes. And then everything stopped. And there was just this 25 seconds of, and I'm just doing this. And everyone's like, what the hell are you doing? So, I mean, it was bad, but I still did it because I knew I could, and I was willing to try, and it, it I mean, how, how are you supposed to be a news intern and then all of a sudden you're doing audio? I loved it. So the idea is try. Give it a shot. Why not? I mean, worst comes to worst, you get yelled at, but so what? You did a pretty good job. They might call Marvin, which is fun. All right, after that, this is fun. Uh, Dean, you may not want to hear this part. I came back and I wanted to be a TA for all the classes, so 365, 455, 465. Oh, actually, and 355 for Scott. I did all those. And um, it was a fun year. I had worked so hard, done two summer sessions, that that year I didn't need to take more than probably about 10 credits. Full-time student is 12. So I ended up being a TA, pushed me to 11. And then I, I knew a friend in the billiards department, because it's a department. Okay, block your ears. And I, uh, I said, hey, Dave, do you need a TA? He's like, no, nah, I'm all full. Because if you're a TA in billiards, you get a credit. He's like, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have anybody left. I'm like, oh, no, I'm not going to show up. He's like, what? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going. So I brought him a case of beer, and he, <laughs> and he gave me a credit that semester. <laughs> so the point is I was willing to cheat the system, and it worked out. 
But the real sub-message is <laughs> I was able to take history of music and history of, of Europe and World War II, things that I really wanted to take but didn't have time for because I took all this stuff ahead of time. I actually could have graduated early. My dad said, no, don't. I said, why? He said, you got plenty of time for awfulness afterwards. Stay in school as long as you can. You do not want to grow up if you don't have to. So I didn't. And that year was awesome because then I was, I don't even know, I may have directed Video Underground. I think I directed Nighttime. And I think I laughed that year more than I've ever laughed in my life. And I don't honestly know if it's possible to do it again. I really don't. In fact, at the end of the year, Marvin had a relationship with Sony. And this went on for maybe, what, 10 or 12 years, I think, something like that. And that year, we got to take eight students to NAB on Sony's dime, which was really cool. We were running, I think we used XD cameras, the Sony XD cameras, for a couple of years. We were running the first couple of those off the assembly line. And we were TDing and doing audio for their big presentation behind the scenes. It was really tired and hung over, but it was really fun. I mean, it was amazing. And I will say, do not get on an escalator with Marvin. Because I was with about eight of us just on the escalator. All of a sudden, we see Marvin. He's oddly down below. How sturdy is this? He oddly down below. And all of a sudden, we just hear this bang. And I see, there it goes. We see Marvin just going, walking out of the hallway, completely walking out. I'm going to pick up that water. No water. And he's out the door. He's gone. Where the hell did Marvin go? And the eight of us are stopped on this escalator. Turns out there's a spot. I'm going to let him teach it to you. You can kick an escalator, and it will completely stop. Three different times. Bang! And he's just... He's pretty good at the power walk, I'm going to be honest. I don't know how you know that. I really, to this day, you wouldn't tell us. At the end of the year, I was ready to relax, went home for a couple of months. Just I didn't even want to travel. I just said, you know what, I want to go home. And just that was when I graduated. I worked on a hay farm for a couple of months. Parents said you could stay there, but you have to apply for jobs, which took about two or three months. Got a job interview at KVW, which is the internship station I was at. It's the sister station. Also got an interview at uh, KNDU in the Tri-Cities. And this is a lesson in leverage, people. Leverage is very important. I got two job offers, one of which would have been a reporter in fill-in weather at the ABC station, and one of which would have been at the NBC station, probably just as a reporter, but the NBC station was number one. Oh, it's all this, that's great, we should do that. Stupidly, and I really do mean that, I called the NBC station, said I'll take it, and called the ABC station saying, no, thank you. I didn't hear their offers. I didn't listen to it. And the guy was like, wait, you don't want to hear it? Nope, I'm good. And I... I you never, ever, ever do that. You have to use your, your leverage and your pot. Marvin's in his face is red now. It was really bad. I, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I was ashamed that I did that. But here's the thing. I accepted one job, signed a lease at an apartment. Yeah. Did everything. Started to move. Turned one job down. Got a call two weeks later saying, I can't hire you. What do you mean you can't hire me? She said, well, you know those two speeding tickets you told me about during our interview? I said, yeah. She said, well, I, I can't insure you. I said, well, you said I'd be fine. She said, I'm, I can't. I said, you know I turned down a job and now am a current renter in Kennewick, and I don't even live there yet. She's like, I'm sorry. And she hung up. So you want to be willing to eat some crow? You want to be willing to keep a job, find a job? I called my other news director and said, so um, guess what happened? Told him the whole story, and he laughed at me. Truly, he did. He was a very nice man, but he laughed at me. He said, well, maybe their mistake is a way we can, you know, move forward and help us out. So he called me about two or three weeks later. And by the way, if you want to talk about pressure when you're waiting two or three weeks after turning down another job and, and owning a, an apartment or renting an apartment in a different city and hoping you get to live there, I mean, it was stressful. It was really stressful. So he called me back about two or three weeks later and said, okay, I'm going to hire somebody that's better than you. I said, oh, okay. I mean, he really said he's way more polished, he's better. Okay? It was just silence. Then he said, well, then I'm also going to try to add one position. I'll see if I can bring you on. Oh, all right. So then two weeks later, he did. And that was the best move I ever made. Because after that, within a year, I was doing some weather. But there was a problem in between. And I want you all journalism students to hear this. I don't mean this as an indictment against journalism. I really don't. It's an indictment against 
what didn't work for me and hopefully what will work for you. So the first year, I'm one-man band, and I'm really good at it. Not necessarily the storytelling part, but I'm really good at the, the production part of it. That was always easy for me. Um, I'm telling stories. You got your own car. You got your own gear. I mean, I already did that as an intern, so it wasn't that big of a deal. But I didn't, I didn't feel it. I didn't like going to the meetings in the morning and not having ideas and having the news director laugh at you or get mad at you. I didn't like the idea of going to a crime scene and having to ask a family, hey, how do you feel? Now, that's not what journalism is, but in that particular station, that's what it was. And I was really having a hard time with it. And I did it for about a year. And there was a moment, I would say, yeah, about a year in or so, I'm in Pendleton. And there was a murder-suicide. So there are two dead bodies in the street, and they sent me. We didn't have live capability out that far. So it would have been a phoner, and I was doing phoners. Um, you know, live hits on the phone. And I'm out there, and you have two dead bodies covered in the tarps or blankets, and you don't have to know what you can show and can't show. And all of a sudden, the sheriff's deputies are there, and then some people show up to the police line. And I can hear the sheriff's deputies, because it's Umatilla County, so it wasn't any you know, local police. Uh, oh, I think that's the family. That's the family. And I looked, and I go, man, that's tough. So I'm the only one there, and I have my camera, I have my tripod, all that. I thought, what am I going to do here? Because you're supposed to go talk to them. You're supposed to. I mean, that's what your boss wants you to do. Okay. So I took my camera off the tripod and I put it down. And I walked over to him and I said, I want you to know that I'm supposed to ask you questions about this because you're the family. They said, yeah. I said, I'm not going to. I said, I can't. I said, I'm, I might get in trouble for this, but here's my card. If you ever want to talk, that's fine, but you don't need to say anything to anybody. And it wasn't in a, in a sabotaging manner for the other stations, but I said, they're coming. So you need to be ready for others to ask you how you're feeling. Because at the end of the day, what I want to know is, journalistically, does that advance the story to get a sad reaction from a murder-suicide? I don't know if it does. I'm not sure if that's good or bad, but it wasn't for me. And I really had a hard time with that. I couldn't, I couldn't see myself going out and doing that anymore. So I don't want that to be you saying, oh, I, I'm not going to be a journalist. That's not what I'm saying journalism is about. Journalism is being the watchdog. Journalism is being the people that take care of the public. But I didn't see how asking someone who had just lost two people how they feel on camera, how that would advance the story. So I didn't. And they called the news director the next day and said, we really want to thank him for not asking us, for keeping us off camera and for telling us that the others would come up. And that meant a lot to me. But I knew at that time I couldn't do it anymore. Oddly enough, at that station, the weather guy who had been there for 20 years just quit one day, started working at Hanford. So they said, well, you know what? We'll look for somebody better. Why don't you do it for now? I said, okay, I'll do it. That sounds great. I didn't care. I was willing to try it. I'll do it. Three months later, yeah, we couldn't find anybody better, so why don't you just do it? Okay, sure. Was there for another couple of years, and all of a sudden, that work that didn't feel right, felt right. The point here is, I don't want you to think every one of you will be the journalism side and it won't feel right. You might go into weather and say this doesn't feel right. You might go into sports, it doesn't feel right. You might go into production to advertising, it doesn't feel right. Whatever it is, you got to figure out what feels right for you. That's the key here. You have to be willing to try something to see if it's going to work for you. After that, I you know, did some things with KXOY, went to the Super Bowl. Oddly enough, my Sports guy's wife was pregnant when the Seahawks went to the Super Bowl, so they sent me, which is random. But I went, and it was awesome. We did you know, hour-long specials in KXOY in Spokane, which for me was a huge deal. I was not competent at all, so the idea of 122 to 75-ish was a huge deal. And at that point, they had a job opening for a morning meteorologist, and uh, I applied for it. It came down to me and one other person, and they hired the other person. And it turned out that they hired the other person because I was only about a year and a half into Mississippi State, which is the meteorology program. And they hired the other person because she was a full-blown meteorologist but really hadn't been on TV yet. They fired her six months later. And at that point, this is the Coog Network park, part, I had a friend named Clint Boxman who randomly emailed me, who I hadn't talked to since graduation, said, hey, buddy, there's a job at Northwest Cable News. Come take a look. Here's the thing. It was reporter again. It was reporter and fill in weather. I thought, oh, gosh, I can't do this again. Plus, the idea of not getting a job in market 75 and then applying for a job in market 12, I mean, my confidence was shot. I said, no, I'm not going to do this. But 
my fiance at the time was coming back from London and we were engaged and she lives in Seattle and I thought I really want to be in London I would love to be in London I want to be in Seattle when she gets back so I thought okay I'll just apply for it we'll see what's what I didn't want to report again but I was willing to get my foot in the door it's kind of like being a PA if you want to be a director or an AD. It's kind of like getting an internship at X, Y, and Z if you want to do whatever it is. I said, forget it. I'll leave a cushy job, cushy-ish, and I will go someplace else doing what I don't want to do. In fact, my cushy job offered me more money. Sub-message, there's always more money, so don't believe them when they say, no, there's no more. There's always more. There's always more. Don't let them tell you you're not worth anything because you are. They say we can only do 2% raises. They're lying. So get some leverage. Don't do what I did. So, after a while, I got the job, and I remember talking to my brother on the phone. He said, why would you leave that job where you're the main weather guy to go to NWCN? What do you think, you're going to be on King 5? I was like, maybe, maybe, I don't know. So I moved to Seattle. I was reporting. It wasn't great, wasn't bad. It was sort of a different kind of station. Everybody's nice, and I was in King's building, which... To me, was awestruck. I wish Dennis was still here because I'd make fun of his cowboy boots he used to wear. But he left. He was killing it with the cowboy boots. He'd always wear them. Anyhow, I'm there. Probably about three months' worth. I'm just reporting. I maybe had done weather a couple of times. And since I got my foot in the door after about three months, Megan Black, who worked at King Forever, switched to traffic, which meant my friend Chris Warren, who's at the Weather Channel now, went to King 5, which meant all of a sudden I had a weather spot. So, oh, I'll do that. And then I am 9 to 5 on Northwest Cable News doing weather. 9 to 5. I mean, it was ridiculous. Those hours do not exist. Probably within a year, King 5 needed some fill-ins, and all of a sudden, I am on King 5. Not permanently. Then I get a call from Portland at KGW. Now, we're on Northwest Cable News, for those of you that don't know, used to be a 24-hour network where they would combine King 5 in Port, uh, Seattle, KGW in Portland, Krem in Spokane, and was it KTVB, Boise? That sounds right. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and they would just do a 24-hour network. So I'm there, and I get a call from KGW in Portland, and they say, hey, we're going to expand our show from 5 to 7 to 4.30 to 7. But our meteorologist is holding out. Would you do it? I said, oh, Yeah. Oh, we're not going to pay you. Uh, uh, yes, I'll do it. Now, don't always say yes to this stuff. There's a, there's a line, and I was told that many times by people there, but I would do it. So that first year and a half, I'm on air from 4 a.m. at Northwest Cable News, then 4.30 at KGW, and then I'm on again for the rest of the day at Northwest Cable News. About three months later, I got switched to three days a week Northwest Cable and KGW to two days a week King 5. And I really wanted to call my brother. I didn't. I really wanted to. I didn't think it was worth it, but I wanted to tell him I did it. And then I'm in the room with one of the goofiest and smartest people I've ever met in my life. He's an older version of me with Rich Marriott. He's been there about 30 years now. Yeah, he's good people. He really, he's, a, he's, just, he's just a sincere buddy. And I'm in there learning from Mississippi State. I'm in there learning from Rich. We're in the same room. The weather centers are the same room. It was ridiculously fun. Never would have thought that would happen. So you think about it. I was at Tri-City Station, then this, and all of a sudden I'm in this role with Rich. I have a station in Portland, which, by the way, not too long after that, that same meteorologist quit. He went across the street to the ABC station, so I get a call three days later. Do you want to come down to Portland? I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to go down to Portland. I, I knew nothing about it. I thought, oh, I love Seattle. It's where we're from. But you got to be willing to try something, right? So I remember meeting with one of my bosses, and they said, look, man, Rich and at the time Jeff, Mer uh, uh, Jeff Renner are going to be here for a long time. What are you going to do? You want to do weekends for the next 10 years? You can. We'd love to have you. I said, well, there's nothing wrong with that, but I don't know if I want to do that. I was probably 27, 28. So I moved, went to KGW. It was one of those things where I said, okay, I'm willing to try something new. And the good thing was, there were two things that prepared me for that. One, I had already been forecasting for them for years on NWCN. And two, I had been on air with them. One of the hardest things if you're going in air, on air is producing chemistry. Having that normal crosstalk reaction with people. We had it with them already because I had been on the air with them for a couple of years at that point. So I said, sure, we'll do it. And professionally, that was the most fun I have ever had and probably will ever have. 
It was amazing. If you've ever, ever been to Portland, there's a studio on the square in the center of downtown at Pioneer Courthouse Square. We had a second studio there. The first three years, I must have seen managers. I must have seen managers three times. We were all completely alone, family, having fun, getting better, trying new things, which leads me to the beginning of social media. Now, granted, we, Marvin still has a Facebook page, which, you know, or MySpace. I was going to say MySpace. I screwed it up. <laughs> Hang on, three, two. Uh, granted, Marvin still has a MySpace page. <laughs> Thank you. That's the reaction I was, okay. Anyways, this was the beginning of the Face Place, the Twitter, all that stuff. And I thought, oh, I don't know if I want to do all that. But you have to be willing because what I'm getting to, it is an adapt or die mentality you need to have. Might sound a little scary. Hopefully enough people have said to you, the first couple of years are going to be hard. It's true. They really will be. But you need to figure out how far you're willing to go, what your limits are, what your line is, because you're going to be pushed to it. For me, social media was pretty tough. I thought I had thick skin. I didn't back then. And I wonder, you've seen the hate and the anger on social media. What I want to know is, was that always there? Did social media bring it out? Did it used to be have a couple of beers and all of a sudden you'd say what you'd say? Now it's you're in front of a keyboard so you can say what you say. I, I don't know. Is it something we just see more often now? I'm not really sure. The problem is, whether it's good or bad, social media is not going away. And it's a really big part of our lives. One of the sessions we had here was, if I have a video that's kind of like this, should I no, just get rid of it? Get rid of it. Don't read comments. Do not let comments get to you. You are who you are. When you make it someplace, you've made it there because you are who you are and you are good. Somebody will find a way to say what I just said is either right-leaning or left-leaning. It's ridiculous. So you have to be you. You cannot let it get to you. Promise me you'll remember that because it is awful sometimes. I mean, even Anna was, I think Anna's left, but she was talking about how she could read a story that is as neutral as you can possibly be. And some, she'll get opposing comments. Well, I thought that, what'd she call it? The, the Chelsea Clinton network, I guess, again, or it's the, it's the Trump leaning, whatever. It doesn't matter. People will find a way to interpret what you're saying in the way they want. And they'll tell you about it on social media. So don't let it get to you. But use it to your advantage. And at that point, Things were starting to change. After maybe, say, about five, six years, I had been with the company for about 10, I got a call from Cairo TV. And I didn't want to leave my company. I had been with them for so long. It initially, it was Belo, Then it was Gannett. Then it was Tegna. And things were starting to change. Now, I will not say anything negative about any company. But the idea is media, the way you approach news, the way you approach long-standing people in the companies, it's changing. There were certain buyouts offered at Tegna for people that had been there for a long time. If we have enough people, great. If we don't, that volunteer, we'll choose some for you. And it went that way, but a lot of the people were happy about it. And I started to think, I, you know, maybe this is the time to switch companies. And I started to realize it wasn't just Tegna. It was everybody is making changes across the board. So that's not a negative comment about Tegna. In fact, I love my company now. The Cox Media Group at Cairo has been around with Cox forever. I wrote that last year, and it still is, but we just got sold. It's going to happen. It's a company named Apollo bought us. It's going to spin off into a separate company called Terrier. Sounds like it'll be great. I really do believe in what it's going to do. I really do. But the idea is we, we don't know where media is going. Things are changing. It's not always the most newsy anymore. I will say I really think that the Cox Media Group has truly held on to journalism in such a strong way. It makes me proud that I work for them. But... We don't know what the future brings. So I'm not saying you should give up on journalism at all. I'm saying be ready to see what it's going to become. Because we were having a conversation before we came out here and spoke. Even 16 years ago, I still didn't see how divided things would be by the number of channels and the number of options we have. So it's really going to be interesting. There are, I, I wish I could remember the exact story, but there are digital companies now that will go to, thanks to the big Spectrum sale, Go to communities that no longer have access to local TV and produce digital local TV for them. I mean, that's not regulated by the FCC. It's going to pop up everywhere. So I don't know where it's going. For example, I don't know where digital's going. Uh, Cairo currently has the most downloaded and used Amazon app in the world. Cairo TV has that? Yeah. It's because one of our bosses pushed the digital side of things. So we have 
an Amazon app, uh, a Roku app, an Apple TV app. We have an Amazon Alexa. We do a show for that. We have an Amazon Echo show, which I think Echo is the, the one that has a little TV screen. We do a show for them too. So it's not just TV anymore, not even close. How much more of that will become only digital? I don't know. I really don't know. We have social media consultants. We have news consultants. We have talent consultants. I hate the word talent. We have everything consultants. You name it, we have it. Are you willing to do it? You have to be. I don't know what to tell you to expect, but you have to be willing to do it. So what I want to end on is this. It is adapt or die again. So happy, right? So morbid. I don't mean it in a morbid way, I promise. How do you stand out, for example, is my phone up here? How do you stand out? How do I stand out as a morning meteorologist been doing this for 16 years against that darn iPhone app? I can't stand that thing because it'll show snow 25 days out. I think that's just completely scientifically impossible. It doesn't happen. You can't. But that will kill it on social media. So then you're forced to respond. What can you do that a phone can't? What can you do that a computer can't? Why would you spend time with us in the morning? It's just that's where we are. We're trying to figure that out. It's not necessarily all about journalism anymore. It's more about how do we make ourselves stand out? And I wish the journalism side could be the strong anchor point. But because we're so divided, I don't know if it can be. But that's your task. Bring that back to us. A lot of stations, and I'm not saying this about Cairo or any company in particular, but a lot of stations are doing more with less and not as well. They just they have to. Their bottom lines are different. They're publicly, publicly traded. It's just the way it is. I will, again, happily say that my company so far has not done that. You guys see me? There you go. I'm very proud to work with you. Cairo. Cairo. I really am. Well, they're watching. I want to make sure they know I'm not mentioning them. So I, this leads me to the next chapter. I'm, almost, I'm just about 16 years in next month, this summer. 16 years this summer. I love it. I, re, I love what I do. I, you have to. I mean, when you get up at 2.30 with three kids, I put down my 7, my 5, and 2-year-old at 7 and go to sleep. I'm exhausted. I get up at 2.30, I get home at 1.30, I'm with the kids all day, I don't have that window at night, I just, I'm with them all day, might squeeze in an hour of like Brooklyn Nine-Nine and call it good, that's it, that's all I get, you're on call all the time, in a weather situation, for me, you gotta tell them where crews are going, what they should do, should they go on earlier, should they be on now, you, you have to accept that and be willing to take the knives when you don't do well, because sometimes, if you miss a storm, well not sometimes, you're gonna hear it, you're really going to hear it, but that's on you. you got to be willing to do it. And I wrote the question, do, do I like the changes coming? I don't know what the changes are. I'm not sure yet. More and more of what we do is digital-based. That makes sense, so I'm willing to learn. More and more of what we do is social media-based. I'm not sure if that makes sense or not, but I'm willing to go with it. And more and more of what we do is becoming, how do we stand out? How do we grab your attention? How do we take you away from your phone? And another thing is, and this is not an indictment on MMJs at all, but that's the next trend. More and more MMJs are coming. Is that good or bad? Maybe that still means more photographers. Maybe that means fewer photographers. I don't know. We have some excellent MMJs here. It's just the trend. Again, I don't know what's coming, but changes are happening so fast. So all I really want to say is the idea is you have to be willing to try it. And I hope you can tell that that's really what I wanted to leave you with. It wasn't my life story because I needed to remind Marvin of how awesome I am. Remember that time I reminded you how awesome I am? It was more that I want you to hear you have to be able to, to, to flow with it. You have to adapt or die. I don't know what other changes will come our way. And at this point, if you're worried, maybe you didn't take all the production classes. Maybe you didn't take whatever the other side of it is, the new side of it. Find a way to learn. Just stop by Marvin's office and say, hey, do you have 20 minutes to show me the camera? It's something. Just know as much as you can. And I will never forget this. Marvin said to me, be nice to your crew if you're on air. That is so true because they can make or break you. I mean, they're very nice people. Oftentimes, they get along with them the most. Don't ever screw them over, and I, I don't mean that. I mean that in a blunt way because they can own you. Be nice to your crew. Do not, this is what I wanted to say earlier, let the word talent make you feel like you're better. I have engineers that could, you know, in the Army, they, make, they made my dad blindfold himself and disassemble his M16 and reassemble it again. Blindfolded. I have engineers that went here that can do that to cameras blindfolded. Why isn't he talented? Why isn't he talented? you got to have that mentality, too. You're not special. 
You're just working hard to be who you want to be. And find out who you are, because in a world with so many options for TV and news, what's different about you? How are you going to make yourself stand out? And I want to remind you, I said this earlier, what we do is a public service. We do not own the airwaves. We do this for people. We forget that because we hear from our bosses, well, profits are down, this and that. That's, that's not why we're here. Ed's cigarette would light up and, and burn the picture if he heard that. You know, it's, By the way, it's still there on the picture. So you have to remember that that's why you're in the business. Now, I want to leave you with something that when I graduated, uh, Kathy Gertson, a former anchor at Como, and who the new building is named after, and of course, a special kook, when she spoke at my graduation in 2003, she said something to me that I hope you've picked up from what I've been saying, but if not, I'll remind you. She said, go out there and make mistakes. Because if you don't, and I think you've picked up, hopefully you've picked up on what I've been saying, you don't learn. you got to fail. You really do. You have to get beaten down. You have to realize, I tried this and did poorly, but now I know how to do this better. Or I tried this and realized, I actually think I'm better at this now as a result. You have to do it. You really have to do it. It is life. It's how we get better. It's how we figure out who we are. Do all of that. And if you'll find out this business is for you, it is unbelievably rewarding. You will love it. And if you can stay in it, I really, really encourage you to do it. And remember why you're here. Remember that you are a safeguard. Remember that if you're on the journalism side of things, you have a public service to perform, and you should feel proud about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's it, everybody. Travel safely. Thank you, thank you for being here, and go Cougs! Go right on. All right.